Grace and peace, family. Welcome to King Priest Ethos Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jakari. If you're tuning in from YouTube, Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, or any listening platform, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, comment, follow the page, turn on notifications for a new message, and leave a rate and review. Let's get into the lesson. All right, so today we're going to read from Galatians chapter 3 from verse 7 to 29. We're going to break this scripture down and we're going to be talking about Abraham's seed being uh, Abraham's family, being part of the children of faith. So in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, it starts off with, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. And this applies that our faith that as children of Abraham, it comes from faith, not from being a physical descendant of Abraham. As believers, we operate on the principle of faith rather than just what we perceive with our senses. It clearly says those who are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. That Abraham's lineage, his legacy, his bloodline was built not on the submission or the adherence to the law, but on his faith. And when we go deep into Abraham's faith, it shows parallels with our own as believers. The scriptures foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles through faith. And this gospel, Abraham was received, was given a gospel, the gospel that was preached to Abraham promising that through him, all nations would be blessed. And the gospel preached to Abraham was about blessing all nations through him, that all the nations will be blessed, showing God's universal plan of redemption. And those who operate in the faith are blessed alongside faithful Abraham. It talks about those who rely on the law, find themselves under a curse because it's impossible to fulfill perfectly every requirement of the law the law yes it's necessary but it can't justify anyone in the sight of god but righteousness comes through faith affirming by the scriptural declaration the just shall live by faith which was said in habakkuk christ's sacrifice on the cross redeemed us from the curse of the law fulfilling his demands and ushering a new covenant a new treaty A new contract through Christ, the blessings promised to Abraham now extends to all believers beyond ethnic, social and gender distinctions and the genders, male and female. Remember that. (laughs) Notice the covenant made with Abraham and his seed. It points to Christ preceding the law by 430 years, underscoring its precedence and permanence. And the law, which was added later due to transgressions, was a temporary measure until the fulfillment of the perfect, the promise in Christ. And the law isn't in opposition to God's promises, but a temporary provision until the arrival of the promised seed comes. And that promised seed was Jesus Christ. And the purpose of the law was to lead us to Christ, was our school teacher. It was our master, our schoolmaster our tutor that guides us towards justification by faith. And with the advent of faith, we're no longer under the law, but through faith in Christ, we become children of God, heirs to the promises made to Abraham. And this spiritual adoption, it erases worldly distinctions. It unites the believers, no matter the backgrounds. Remember, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus and heirs to the promises made to Abraham. Through faith, we receive the promise of the Holy Ghost. The same way the apostles and the early believers through 100, they were about 150 up in the upper room, they received on the day of Pentecost. So when you, so Galatians 3 
is literally showing the primacy of faith in God's redemptive plan, showing the lineage tracing back to Abraham, how the law was inadequate for us to justify us, and the surpassing nature of the promises, which was what? Fulfilled in Christ. And as believers, we're heirs to the blessings of Abraham through faith. If we are faith, we are Abraham's seed. And it goes beyond earthly divisions and receiving the promised Holy Ghost as a seal of our inheritance. When you read scriptures like Hebrews 11, people like Noah, Enoch, all of them lived by faith. They received the promise of the Spirit through faith and sought a country better than the one on earth. The law was added because of sin, sins and transgressions, because people had stony hearts, the hardness of their hearts. God said he's going to remove those stony hearts. <laughs> Amen. And Abraham was given a promise, not a law. The law was like the schoolmaster. It guides us to recognize sin and ungodliness to prepare us for the coming of Christ, wherein we may be justified by faith, not about our own actions or our work, but rather we let Christ do the work instead of us trying to do it ourselves. And the Holy Ghost helps and guides us, teaching us truth to avoid doing wrong. In being baptized in Christ, we put on Christ because Christ lives in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. No matter where we come from, no matter who we are, we are all one in Christ Jesus and we are a united community. Remember, we are of Christ, we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob was renamed Israel by God who had 12 sons. And guess what? It formed the 12 tribes of Israel. Christ came from one of those tribes, Judah. So this timeline literally paints a picture of generational blessings of Abraham's seed as those who are of faith share the same blessing with Abraham which is the promise in Matthew 22 verse 32 Jesus says I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and Jesus emphasizes God's identity as God of the living not of the dead even though Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they passed away physically, God still claims them as his own. Let's, let's get into it. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and gave himself for me. This is talking about living by faith. Regardless of the earthly lives, the duration of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they remain spiritually alive due to their faith. They were mortal men. Individuals aware of their divine connection. They were aware of God. Same way in Job 30 verse 23. Anticipating an eternal dwelling. The promise of an everlasting abode, which Jesus articulates, which instills hope, reassuring the believers, let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are there many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Christ's assurance of returning to gather his followers signifies, represents the, ex the exclusive pathway to eternal life. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, Our earthly existence is transient, but our spiritual inheritance is imperishable. A spiritual construction which awaits us in eternity. Living by faith aligns us with the legacy of Abraham. Showing faithfulness like, Stephen's, like Stephen was, full of faith and of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 6 verse 5. We believers face mortality with conviction, glimpsing the eternal realm. And Stephen's calm departure shows the transient nature of physical death when anchored in the eternal promises of God. In Luke 13, verse 1 to 17, this talks about the story of the woman who had suffered from, you know, a condition for 18 years. Her 
she was bent over, unable to straighten her back. Jesus saw her and said, Women, woman, thou art loose. He, he literally says, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And guess what? She got straightened up and praised God. But yet the religious leaders in the synagogue, they, were, they had a problem with it because Jesus healed her on the Sabbath. And then Jesus told them, you hypocrites, don't each of you untie your ox or your donkey from the stall on the Sabbath and lead it out to give it water? Shouldn't this woman, who is a daughter of Abraham, who Satan hath bound for 18 long years, has set her free on the Sabbath day? When they heard this, they were ashamed. And the people rejoiced at the wonderful things Jesus did. Jesus literally showed the significance of faith and the promise given to the descendants of Abraham. Highlighting the adherence of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, the religious rulers and lawyers. That they shouldn't hinder acts of compassion and healing, especially on the day like the Sabbath day. It's literally Jesus' mission to liberate people from burdens imposed by the bind the binding of Satan, the man-made carnal doctrine that imprisons believers, that don't set them free, that are bound to the law, bound to things that don't bear fruit, that don't have spiritual endurance, have spirit don't bring spiritual growth. Jesus did not come to establish a new religious system, but to bring a kingdom where faith, compassion, and freedom prevails. Same way like Zacchaeus, he experienced a transformation when he met Jesus. Salvation and hope are offered to all who believe in him. Through faith in Christ, believers are connected to the legacy of Abraham, heir to the promise of blessings for all nations. James and James literally poses the question Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Do you see how faith worked together with his actions? And by his actions, faith was made complete. The scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Same way with Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And when you when you read something like this, you wonder, you know, you think, oh, Abraham, Abraham was the father of faith. Where do the works fit in? And whoever and the one who wrote this was James, the brother of Jesus. But yeah, let's. Compare it to what Paul says in Romans 4. He acknowledges Abraham's faith when he says this. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He literally said Abraham was justified by works. If Abraham was justified by works, he would have something to boast about, but not before God. Paul makes it clear that righteousness is credited to those who believe in God, not by their own works, but by their faith. It looks different. James, it looks like James and Paul contradict each other when it comes to things like faith and works. Paul is emphasizing faith. James is emphasizing works. And let me tell you something. They're both valid. In Acts, there was a debate regarding works, the law, and faith in Christ. And both of them presented fair arguments. James, now remember, James was not the was part of the original 12, but he was the brother of Jesus. There weren't only 12, yes, there were 12 foundational apostles with Matthias being the replacement of Judas. But when you read it, you have Titus, Silvanus, Timotheus, Barnabas, James, the Lord's brother, Paul, Barnabas, men like that who were also apostles. So, What is the relationship between faith and works? Works are the expression of faith. When Abraham offered Isaac on the altar, it wasn't by his own initiative, but obedience to God's command. His actions demonstrated his faith. Same way with Rahab. Her actions were motivated by her faith in God's promises. 
Faith, yes, faith without works is dead because true faith produces outward change. But it's not about individual effort, but about the transformation which is wrought by Christ within us. It's about living in accordance with God's will, guided by his grace. Paul says it's not about our own works, but about believing in the one who justifies the ungodly. Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness before he was circumcised. Circumcision became a symbol of righteousness, but true righteousness comes from faith, not from following the law. Faith goes beyond boundaries, extending to all who believe regardless of their ethnicity and gender. Abraham's faith, even though he had to go through obstacles, it served as an example for us. He trusted in God's promises without doubting. He gave glory to God. His faith grew stronger over time, and it affirms his belief in God's faithfulness. So, James and Paul, they offer a valid insight into the relationship between faith and works. Faith is not just believing, but also acting in accordance with God's will. It's about trusting in God's promises and allowing his grace to transform us from within. And Abraham's faith proves this. It's evident to us, reminding us that true righteousness comes from trusting in Christ alone. <laughs> Amen. Now, let's really talk about Abraham now. Abraham's genealogy. It begins with Abraham, who identified as a Hebrew, and his lineage traces back to Shem, as documented in Genesis 10. Shem was where the term Semitic came. He had five sons, Elam, Ashur, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. And out of all those five sons, Arphaxad is notable. He is the ancestor of all the sons of Eber where the term Hebrew originates. Abraham is positioned six generations from Eber, which earned him the ethnicity of a Hebrew. He resided in the Canaanite town of Hebron. And then when you go into the lineage of Shem, you have Elam, which is situated in the mountain regions east. Of the Tigris and Euphrates Valley, which is modern day southwest Iran. And Susa was its ancient capital. And there are some archaeologists, initially, they attribute the settlement of this area to Ham and the discoveries established in Semitic origins, aligning with Shem's lineage. Notably, Elam features in Abraham's conflict with a coalition of kings. Remember, the king of Alam, Elam. Remember in Genesis 14, when Abraham went to war? Elam's proximity to the descendants of Ham, Babylon, and Assyria. And Elam will be succeeded by his sibling line, Ham. Then you have Ashur, who is situated along the upper Tigris River from what is now northern Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, Babylon. It became synonymous with the Assyrian people and their land, which is Assyria, obviously. And this lineage will it intertwines with both Ham and Shem's line. And it culminates to the formation of the Assyrians and they gained infamy for their oppression of the Israelites which is not a good thing then you have Arfix, Arfaxads Arfaxids descendants include Lud whose location does not specify geographically Aram is identified by the Greeks as Syria associated with the region of Elam or Assyria as indicated in the prophecies of Amos Aram's migration westward led to the emergence of the Aramians or the Syrians. One of Aram's descendants, Uz, became the head of the Aramian tribes. Uz's lineage goes with that of Nahor, Abraham's brother. We also know about Job. He hailed from the lineage of Uz, and he's depicted as a righteous man who endured immense suffering. We know about Job. He didn't curse God. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Regardless, everything taken away from him and what he went through, his trials and tribulation. Then Eber, he had two sons, Peleg and Joktan. They serve uh, as pivotal figures in the ancestry of the Hebrews. 
So Peleg's name is attributed to the division of the earth during his lifetime, which was Genesis 10, 25. And this division alludes to significant geographical or cultural shifts of that era. And Joktan's descendants include Arabian groups, Al-Mudad, Shalef, Hazar Maveth, Jarath, Jera, Hadoram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abomeo, Sheba, Ofer, Havila. I remember Ophir is renowned for its gold. It was sought after by King Solomon and Jehoshaphat. It was mentioned in Genesis 2, Havila. I mean, yeah, Havila was mentioned in Genesis 2, was described as rich in gold and other resources. Shem's lineage sheds light on, you know, the diversity and the heritage of Abraham, anchoring him firmly within the narrative of Hebrew history. Now, to go into Abraham's life. In Genesis 17, when he was at the age of 99, he had an encounter with the Lord. And God declared himself as the Almighty. And he instructed Abraham to walk before him and be perfect. Promising to establish a covenant between him, between them, and to multiply Abraham exceedingly. And in response to what God, to the gospel, which was preached to Abraham, he fell on his face. And God initiated a dialogue with him. And in this conversation, God assured Abraham that a covenant will indeed be established between them. And Abraham will be regarded as the father of many nations. And God announced a change in Abraham's name when he went when he used to be Abram. Now he became Abraham, showing his role as the progenitor of numerous nations. It wasn't, you know, it was not just merely symbolic in his name, but it represented the fulfillment of God's promise and marked the beginning of a new chapter in Abraham's life. And through the circumcision, Abraham received the seal of the covenant a physical reminder of his chosen status and his commitment to God's plan. And this significance of circumcision extends beyond the physical lack. It's, it's a deeper spiritual truth. Same way Abraham was circumcised in the flesh, we believers are circumcised by the Spirit of God and justified through faith. Circumcision serves as a tangible expression of one's alignment with God's covenant and his promises. And, he, and God reiterated his pledge to Abraham, promising that he would be exceedingly fruitful and nations and kings would descend from him. And this covenant would extend to Abraham's descendants, particularly through Christ, who would fulfill the promise of blessing for all nations. The land of Canaan was designated as an everlasting possession for Abraham and his descendants, symbolizing God's enduring faithfulness to his covenant and his promises. And this land is a serves as a reminder of God's commitment to Abraham and his line throughout generations. Even God instructed Abraham to circumcise every male in his household as a visible sign of the covenant. It was to be performed on the eighth day of life and applied to all members of Abraham's household, regardless of their origin. And those who did not receive the circumcision will be excluded from the community of the covenant. Sarah, Abraham's wife, was also promised blessings by God. Even though she was old in age, she bore a son named Isaac, who played a crucial role in continuation of God's covenant promises. Even though Abraham's involvement with Hagar and the birth of Ishmael, God affirmed that his covenant will be established specifically with Isaac and his descendants. Abraham faithfully followed God's command, circumcising all the males in his household, including Ishmael. And this act demonstrated Abraham's obedience and commitment to God's covenant, even before its formal ratification through circumcision. It literally, so Genesis 17 literally portrays the establishment of God's covenant with Abraham as a pivotal moment in history. And through the renaming of Abraham, the institution of circumcision and the promises made regarding the descendants and the land, God solidified his commitment to Abraham and his lineage. And this covenant ultimately fulfilled in Christ serves as a testament to God's faithfulness and his enduring relationship with his people. 
in Genesis 12, verse 1 to 9, the Lord speaks to Abram, who was later known as Abraham. He commanded him to leave his homeland, his relatives, his father's household, and to journey to a land that God will reveal. <clears throat> God promises to make Abram into a great nation, to bless him, make his name renowned and renowned, and bring blessings to those who bless him and curses to those who curse him. And through Abram, God makes a pledge, a promise to bless all families of the earth. Abram was at the age of 75. He obeyed the commandments of the Lord. He took his wife Sarai, later called Sarah, and his nephew Lot, the son of his brother, with him. They traveled to Canaan, passed through the various regions like Shechem and Moreh, where the Canaanites dwelled. And in Canaan, the Lord appeared to Abram, promising to give that land where they're at to his descendants. And in response, Abraham... Abram built an altar to worship the Lord who had appeared to him and set up his tent, which symbolize, symbolizes his dwelling in the land promised by God. And as Abram journeyed on, he continues to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, during this time, Abram was not yet circumcised. He was not circumcised yet, but God made promises to him. It shows the predestinated nature of God's plan for Abraham and his descendants. And it's, you, remember, it's worth, it's worth considering also that Noah's blessings upon Shem in Genesis 9, where he prophesied that Canaan will serve as a servant to Shem's descendants. This prophecy fulfilled in the eventual possession of Canaanite lands by the descendants of Shem, specifically the Hebrew people who later became known as the Israelites because Abraham was a Hebrew. And this fulfillment serves as a testament to the promise and predestination of God's plan as initiated by Noah. In Genesis 13, we witness Abraham's wealth. Even before he received the promise, he was rich, cattle, silver, gold, servants, prosperous with riches that overflowed. Even Lot, he was also wealthy too. But when Lot separated from Abraham, God began to speak to Abraham instructing him to lift up his eyes and behold the vastness of the land, promising it to him and his descendants forever. Abram, in his response, you know what he did? He built an altar to the Lord, marking the significance of God's promise. Genesis 15 then reveals God's reassurance to Abram. The Bible says the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. Despite Abraham's concern about lacking an heir with only Eleazar of Damascus as his potential inheritor. God assured Abraham that his own flesh and blood will be his heir. God directed Abraham's gaze towards the heavens, promising descendants as numerous as the stars. In an act of faith, this act of faith, Abraham believed God's promise. Despite his old age, and this faith was counted unto him as righteousness. And this faith in God's promises is a principle which is far more valuable than any rituals or religious practices. And whether circumcised or not, baptized or not, what matters is the belief in God's word. For example, Cornelius, he had not yet received the Holy Ghost. And Moses, who was uncircumcised when God spoke to him, he highlighted this truth. Despite doubts or imperfections, God still chose to engage with individuals who believed in him. Abraham's story is a testament to the power of faith. Despite his doubts and uncertainties, God remained faithful to him. Abraham's faith is what stood out. His destiny was predetermined before the foundations of the world. God promised him not only the land, but also the assurance of a prosperous future for his descendants, even foretelling their temporary sojourn in a foreign land and their subsequent deliverance. And in his old age, Abraham died peacefully, having lived a fulfilled life. His faith in God's promises never faded away and never disappeared. He passed on knowing that his legacy will endure through his descendants. And this covenant between God and Abraham, marked by faith and fulfillment, is a testament to the enduring power of belief and the faithfulness of God to his promises. Amen. 
in Genesis 18, verse 16 and 19, it speaks about the moment when men rose up and turned their gaze towards Sodom. Abraham, upon seeing this, he went up to accompany them on their journey. The Lord then questioned whether he should conceal his intentions from Abraham, acknowledging that Abraham was destined to become a great and influential nation, with all the nations of the earth blessed through him. The Lord expressed his knowledge of Abraham's character, recognizing that he would instruct his descendants to uphold the ways of the Lord, practicing justice and righteous judgment, or in other words, righteousness. It was through this obedience that the promises made to Abraham will be fulfilled. So what did Abraham do? And what should we do as children of Abraham do? We are not called only to live righteously ourselves, but to pass on these teachings to our children and our children's children and descendants and future generations. This command extends to every member of the household, from maids and the butlers to the chefs and the babysitters, to the nannies. Everyone under our roof, our family, our friend, our community, we have to adhere to the ways of the Lord. As Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Assuring that all that follow the commandments of the Lord to act justly and fairly. This was the covenant to uphold justice and righteousness. Ensuring the fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham. It's not about outward actions, but about the inward transformation brought about by the Holy Ghost. Abraham received the promise through faith, symbolized by circumcision, representing the man of faith. <laughs> Amen. In Genesis 13 verse 20, we see a moment where Abraham, who, who feared, fearing for his life, he had to lie. He had to tell those in Egypt that, you know, Sarah was his sister. Out of concern that they might harm her, they might harm him due to her beauty. So this act of deceit reflects Abraham's human frailty, but it also highlights his faith. Remember, we all have sinned, fall short. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're human. We make mistakes. Even Paul says when he tried to do right, he does wrong. And you know, the Bible talks about grace teaches us to deny all worldliness, godliness, but to live soberly, righteously, holy, and all these types of things. Remember, when Abraham and Sarah, when they went to Egypt, they encountered the king, the Pharaoh. And Abraham, he feared for his safety. He called, he labeled his wife, Sarah, as his sister. And let me tell you something. This type of act of deception could have led to consequences when the king took Sarah into his palace. But guess what? God intervened. He warned the king in a dream that Sarah was actually Abraham's wife. And once the king realized the truth, he confronted Abraham, who defended himself by saying he had not lied directly, but had concealed the full truth out of fear. Abraham's plea to God not to punish the king for his actions reveals his concern for the well-being of others, even in the midst of his own fear. He argues that the king acted innocently, unaware. He didn't even know Sarah was married. It wasn't the king. It wasn't. Pharaoh's fault that Abraham ain't tell him. But you know how God deals with him. Who knows the mind of God? God acknowledges Abraham's integrity and intervenes to protect him and Sarah from harm. Remember, God called Abraham a prophet. And this shows the relationship between God and Abraham. And despite his shortcomings, Abraham's faithfulness and willingness to intercede on behalf of the Egyptians earned him the title of a prophet. And through his actions, he exemplified the power of faith to transform ordinary individuals into instruments of divine grace. Even in the New Testament, James refers to Abraham as a friend of God. It shows the depth of their relationship built on faith and obedience. And the journey of Abraham reminds us that even in moments of doubt and fear, our faith can sustain us and lead us into deeper communion with the Holy One of Israel. Hallelujah. In Genesis 22, verse 13 and 18, there is a moment where Abraham, when he lifted up his eyes, he saw a ram ensnared by its horns in a thicket. He then took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering. 
In this act, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and commended him for his unwavering faith. And this angel acknowledged Abraham. It was the angel of the Lord, which was Jesus. This angel acknowledged Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his only son as a testament to his faithfulness. In response to Abraham's obedience, the angel conveyed divine blessings upon him, which was Jesus, the angel of the Lord. These blessings include what? The promises of multiplied descendants, like, like the stars in the heavens and the grains of the sand upon the seashore. Abraham's offspring will possess the gates of their enemies, signifying strength and dominion. The angel proclaimed that through Abraham, all nations of the earth will be blessed, showing the importance of obedience to God's commands. This is showing the faith expressed through action. Belief without corresponding deeds is insufficient. True faith is demonstrated through obedience to the voice of God. Obedience, rather than ritualistic sacrifices or religious traditions, is the essence of genuine faith. To obey is better than to sacrifice. To do righteous justly is to better is better than sacrifices offering all these things. It involves heeding God's commands even when they seem irrational or challenging. Obedience to God's will is paramount. It's not about performing outward acts, but about submitting to God's authority with trust and devotion. Through obedience, we align ourselves with God's purposes and invite His blessings into our lives. Even I want to highlight about Japheth. He fathered, he had fathered a lot of descendants. Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, Tiras. From Gomer's line, diverse ethnic groups like the Greeks, Armenians, certain tribes of the Meshech region. Some of them could be, the lineage is also thought to include some of the ancient inhabitants of what is now modern day Turkey. Javan was the son of Japheth. He had it was believed to be he was a progenitor of numerous peoples like the Romans, the French, Italians, Spanish, and Portuguese. And the influence of his descendants is evident in rich cultural heritage of the Mediterranean region. Magog, according, is associated with the Scythians and other tribes, which includes the Eurasian steep. His descendants are include the Slavs. The Russians, Bulgarians, Bohemians, Croatians. Madai, another son of Japheth. The Indo-Iranian people. The Indians, Iranians, Afghans, Kurds. This lineage encompasses a broad swath of territory from the Indian subcontinent to the Persian plateau and beyond. Yeah, Tubal, whose name is often associated with regions in modern day Turkey. He is believed to have fathered the Thracians and various Germanic tribes. His descendants include groups that settle in the Caucasus region, where it get the Caucasian race come from. Meshek, closely associated with the region of modern-day Russia, is believed to have fathered the Muscovites and other early Slavic tribes, and their influence extended across the vast expanse of Eastern Europe and Eurasia. And then you have Tiras. It's less prominently mentioned, in, but it has it's thought to given the rise of people that lived around the region of the Black Sea. And everything that happened in the ancient trade networks of the Black Sea was from Tyrus. So you see why, remember, Japheth shall enlarge, but they will dwell in the tents of Shem. So all these things about Christianity is a white man religion is nonsense, it's false. It's more likely prophetic. Because Japheth largened its territory, extended, but guess what? They dwell in the tents of Shem. And that's why half of the Europe are orthodoxy, you know, Catholic. They have the faith. Amen. Just wanted to point that out. Now, and also, I, that was a quote. Someone said it like this. The faith began in Israel. In Italy, it became a religion. In the Western world, the European world, it became a business. 
But when it came to Africa, it became spiritual. I just wanted to highlight that, but let's continue <laughs> regarding Abraham. Isaiah 29, verse 22 to 24. It starts off interesting. Therefore, thus says the Lord. And it's talking about God's redemption of Abraham and his continued covenant with the house of Jacob. And Jacob, who was the forefather of the 12 tribes of Israel, is assured that he will not be put to shame, nor his countenance falter. Instead, there is a promise of familial pride and divine presence. And this verse paints a vivid picture of Jacob beholding his descendants, the handiwork of God. And in their midst, they will be a reverence for the divine, a sanctification of God's name and the fear of the God of Israel. The mention of Jacob's children sanctifying God's name. And what's the name of God? Jesus Christ. It underscores the concept that when Christ works within individuals, they are inspired to glorify God. And the filling of the Holy Ghost leads to a natural outpouring of praise, honor, and glory to the Almighty God. And this type of sanctification extends to revering the Holy One of Jacob, showing a deep respect and a desire not to transgress against God. To fear God embodies both awe and obedience, encapsulating a profound reverence for the reverend. For the word of God says, holy and reverend is his name. Those who stay, who strayed in spirit will find enlightenment, indicating a path to understanding and spiritual clarity. Those who have been prone to discontent or murmuring will find themselves instructed in divine doctrine, the doctrine of the kingdom of God. And this implies a transformation. For transformative power within the teachings of the kingdom of God. Not some theoretical knowledge, but in the tangible manifestation of spiritual principles, speaking to transformation and its potential of revelation and deepening of spiritual understanding. In Isaiah 48, I believe, either Isaiah 48. God addresses both the nation, the ancient nation of Israel and the broader concept of church, which Paul later referred to as the Israel of God. And this passage resonates with profound significance as it reflects God's enduring relationship with his chosen people and his commitment to their well-being. God's selection of Jacob, who was renamed Israel, it underscores his deliberate choice of a specific lineage through which to fulfill his divine purposes. Jacob's transformation into Israel symbolizes not only a personal renaming, but also a communal identity shift, signifying God's intention to work through a particular group of people. And this renaming carries echoes of God's covenant with Abraham, who he called, esteemed as a friend. The friendship between the, human, the humanity and the divine, the relationship between Abraham and God, is greater than any kind of theology. It finds its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ, who declared, Greater love hath no man than this, than he that laid down his life for his friends. John 15, verse 13. God's message in Isaiah 48, verse 8 to 20, his reassurance to Israel and the church that they are not forsaken. Despite any feelings of abandonment or fear, God affirms his continuous presence and support. His declaration, I am with you, always, even unto the end of the world, serves as a powerful reminder of his omnipresence, and his commitment to his people throughout history. This companionship is not contingent upon human merit or achievement, but is rooted in God's own character of faithfulness and love. God's promise to strengthen, help, and uphold his people with his righteous right hand carries profound implications, showing his authority and ability to intervene on behalf of his beloved. The imagery of God's hand evokes notions of protection, guidance, and provision, reinforcing the idea that his people are securely held within his grasp. The assurance that those who oppose Israel and the church will be put to shame, highlighting God's ultimate triumph over advers adversity. This divine vindication serves as a source of hope and encouragement for believers facing opposition or persecution. It underscores the principle of of divine justice and the ultimate defeat of evil forces and the cosmic struggle between good and evil.
Paul's identification of the church as the Israel of God in Galatians 6.16 shows the continuity, the continuation and the interconnectedness of God's redemptive plan throughout history, showing spiritual inheritance shared by all the believers, no matter ethnic or cultural distinctions. It's reinforcing the idea that God's covenant, covenantal promises extends beyond physical lineage to encompass a spiritual kinship rooted in faith. The transformation of barrenness landscapes into flourishing ecosystems symbolizes God's transformative power and ability to bring life out of desolation. His promise to provide abundantly for his people reflects his nature as a generous and compassionate provider. This imagery evokes a sense of awe and wonder at the miraculous work of God in revitalizing and in renewing his creation. <sighs> Glory to God. Abraham's friendship with God serves as an example of faith and obedience. His willingness to trust in God's promises, even in the face of, face of uncertainty. Showing this kind of intimate relationship to which all believers are called. Abraham's faith journeys underscores the foundational principle that salvation is by faith alone, apart from works of the law. Romans 4 verse 5. God's grace extends through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, serving as the basis for forgiveness and redemption. Through faith in, through faith in Jesus Christ, believers are justified and reconciled to God, receiving the gift of salvation freely bestowed by grace. And this transformative work of grace empowered believers to live holy and righteous lives, empowered by the indwelling presence of the Holy Ghost. And I want to end with this regarding, you know, Abraham. In Isaiah 48, verse 8 to 20, it offers a profound meditation on God's faithfulness, his redemptive purposes, his kingly position. Reminding us of his enduring commitment to his people, both ancient and modern, and invites us to place our trust in him alone. And through faith in Christ, we become heirs of God's promises, recipients of his grace, and participants in his ongoing work of redemption in the world. And if any man be in Christ, we are of Abraham's seed. Thank you for listening to this message. I pray that this word enlightens both the viewers and listeners. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. God bless.